It's now time to talk about one of the most exciting sites in paleoanthropology. And admittedly, I'm probably biased because it's a site that I've worked at for more than 10 years now. But Dimenisi, located in Georgia, is one of the most important sites for understanding what normal variation looks like, especially in early Homo, at the beginning of the Pleistocene. The site itself is interesting because it's situated within the midst of these medieval ruins. Actually, a medieval complex that was present at the site from about 500 AD to about 1300 AD. And the discovery of the site, the discovery of these 1.8 million year old sediments at Dimenisi, was related to the archaeological work actually with the medieval site. Looking at where we're situated, one of the important things about Dimenisi is it's the earliest hominid site outside of Africa. So we're moving into a different environment, which is part of the important context we need to understand in interpreting the remains from Dimenisi. Georgia is situated here in the midst of the Caucasus mountain ranges, but 1.8 million years ago, it would have been a more Mediterranean style climate, as the Black Sea and Caspian Sea would have been connected as a single body of water north of the Greater Caucasus. Looking in more closely at the actual location of the site itself, Dimenis is situated on a promontory just west of the confluence of two rivers, the Mashavera River and the Pinazari River. 1.8 million years ago, there was a series of active volcanoes west of Dimenisi, forming a range of mountains seen here. Now, these areas were volcanically active and delivered an underlying basalt or lava that filled in this entire valley area around Dimenisi, known as the Mashavera basalt that forms the base of the site itself and is dated to about 1.85 million years of age. Now, the site itself is situated right at the confluence of these rivers, and these rivers would have been present 1.8 million years ago. So when the Mashavera basalt came in, one of the things it did is it created a little ephemeral paleo lake at the site of Dimenisi by blocking the Pinazawa River. So the site itself is situated in the middle of these two rivers, next to a lake, in an area that, generally speaking, is semi-arid. So Dimenisi would have been a very productive site within the broader environment of the area, and is maybe one of the reasons why we have such good fossils and so many fossils and such a diversity of fossils from this locality. Looking at the site itself, here's a view actually from the site looking northwest into the Mashavera Valley, and you can see the thick basalt that forms the basis of the site, the 1.8 million year old or 1.85 million year old Mashavera basalt. Looking at the fossils themselves, the initial excavations of the Paleolithic sediments began in 1991. And the end of that first season produced this fossil, the Dimenisi 211 mandible. Now, this mandible is controversial because of its anatomy and because of its initial discovery in the midst of these medieval ruins. Some people doubted whether it was really a lower Pleistocene early Homo fossil. And they did so on the basis of a number of features. One is that the specimen has a slight projecting mental eminence, or chin as we might call it, which is usually more of a modern characteristic, something we see later in the Pleistocene. It also has a very small third molar, actually incredibly small for lower Pleistocene fossil hominins, and an overall pattern of M1 larger than M2, which is larger than M3. And again, these are characteristics that we associate with later Pleistocene humans. However, these features aside, the specimen is actually a very robust specimen, and actually similar in many ways to OH7, the type specimen for Homo habilis. If we compare, for example, the size and morphology of the premolars, there's a lot of similarity between these two specimens. Likewise, the overall size of the first molar is very similar between them as well, as is the overall robusticity of the corpus, how broad that corpus is. There are a lot of similarities between OH7 and DMNEC211. So, Dimenisi 211, even by itself, is a fairly clear lower Pleistocene early Homo specimen. This was confirmed in subsequent discoveries as the site has produced an abundance of fossil hominin remains. These four crania, as well as four mandibles, represent just a fraction of the overall assemblage from Dimenisi. And what makes Dimenisi important is how well preserved these specimens are, and the fact that you have individuals who preserve multiple skeletal elements. So these three mandibles that run across the top and the three skulls that sit above them are all belonging to the same individual. So you have the skull and mandible of three separate individuals. And as we'll see, we now have a fourth individual that fits this pattern as well. So relative to the East African fossils that we've talked about so far, scattered across a huge range of time and space, the Dimenisi material is all coming from a very, very narrow window of time, all coming from the same place, and we have lots of individuals showing a lot of variation. In 1999, this skull was recovered, the Dimenisi 2282 specimen, which is very small and very gracile. It has a lot of similarities, in fact, to some of the early Homo habilis material we've already talked about. There's a low sloping forehead, 
Overall, a very small cranial capacity, a little bit of facial prognathism, although this specimen needs to be reconstructed to really visualize that, a small supraorbital torus, though the one that consists of a single bar that runs across the front, fairly wide zygomatics and cheeks. Here we have a supraorbital sulcus, but overall a very small skull with a cranial capacity that's at the low end of the HOMO range but one that's perhaps very similar to a specimen like ER 1813, which we'll refer to again later. DMDC 2280 also has a fairly continuous superorbital torus, though one that's a little bit thicker than 2282. It has a larger vault with a higher forehead. You can see the temporal lines coming up on the sides very clearly. In terms of its endocranial volume, it's much larger, closer to 750, maybe even 770 cc's, and again is much more reminiscent of the early Homo erectus material that we'll see in East Africa than Homo habilis. Now, the next year produced yet another specimen, this D2600 mandible, which in many proportions is the largest mandible we assign to the genus Homo anywhere in the fossil record. It has an incredibly tall ramus, an incredibly tall corpus height, and very large dentition. So very different than the pattern we saw in the D211 mandible, that original one. So different that when the specimen was first discovered and published, it was described as a different species, Homo georgicus. To see the difference between these two mandibles, we can look at them side by side here, and you can see this tremendous difference in the size of the corpus itself, and the overall proportions of this specimen. Now you'll also notice on the D2600 specimen that there's very interesting patterns and very aggressive wear of the teeth. If you look across the anterior dentition, you see this sort of curvilinear pattern of wear across the roots of the incisors, suggesting this specimen was doing something non-standard in terms of how it's used its teeth. It was basically using its teeth probably as a tool or to hold on to some kind of material in the context of tool making. If we look across the molars, we can see there's this curvilinear wear, pattern of wear that extends down onto the roots of the first molar as well. And when we look at that in detail, we can say that this individual wore down its teeth at a more rapid rate than any Pleistocene hominid specimen we have in terms of the relative wear of the first molar compared to the second molar compared to the third molar. So some of the morphology of this specimen has to do with the specific wear of its teeth and how it was using its teeth. The next year produced yet more remains, including this mandible and associated cranium that belongs to the D2700 individual. This is another small grass isle specimen with an endocranial volume of about 650 cc's. It's also a subadult. You can see here that the third molar is just beginning to erupt, so it's maybe a young teenager. It's got a flat face with a little bit of subnasal prognathism. It also has the postbragmatic depression, which we've seen in the other specimens. It has a low, flat, sloping frontal bone. It again has a very projecting prominent glabella, like we've seen in the other specimens from Dimenisi. And it again has a fairly robust, though small, cheek extending laterally from the specimen. If we look at the mandible, we can see that again, it's a fairly small mandible. The third molar is absent, but it would actually probably be quite small if it were present at the time. It has actually fairly large canines if we look at these teeth, but it doesn't have the projecting chin, and it doesn't have the superficial structures of the jaw that are consistent with an adult. Again, going along with the fact that this is a sub-adult individual. The next year produced yet more remains, and again, remarkable remains. This completely preserved skull, D3444, which is interesting for a number of reasons, one of which is that it lacks any teeth. And not only does it lack any teeth, it lacks the bone that houses that teeth. Now this is characteristic of what happens when you lose your teeth. When you lose your teeth, that bone that holds your teeth together is also resorbed, given your body no longer needs those tissues. But this is a process that takes time. So this is an individual that lacked teeth for an extended period of time at the end of its life, which means it survived without its teeth. This is important because we usually think of our dentition as a measure of our life. As we wear out our teeth, we die. You need your teeth to process food, so without them, it's hard to survive. And yet this was an individual that did survive for a long period of time without any teeth. Now one way of explaining this is that there was some degree of social care, and other individuals caring for this individual. Either way, it's indicative that this individual had the technology to survive absent teeth, which is an important change in how we think about hominin evolution with early Homo. Here's the mandible of this specimen, and you can again see this lack of dentition very clearly, where the molars and even the muscle attachment areas of this mandible have been lost. And overall size, this is again a very small specimen with an endocranial volume of the same range of 600 to 650 cc's, although obviously a much older individual. Now, that brings us to the most recent published specimen from Dimnesi. 
Discovered in 2005, this specimen actually goes with that large D2600 mandible, which fills in a tremendous gap for our understanding of Dimenisi. And in many ways, this specimen, just recently published in the journal Science, completes the picture for how we understand Dimenisi variation. Looking at this specimen as it's been prepared, we can see that it again has a very large, robust face, although on a very small specimen. The overall estimated cranial volume on this specimen, perhaps one of the most surprising features of it, is only 550 cc's. That's at the high end of the Australopithecine range, the extreme low end of the Homo range, and suggests how primitive these Dimenisi specimens are. It also has a very prognathic lower face, again reminiscent of earlier things like Australopithecus africanus, like STS-5 from Sturkfontein. It has a large zygomatic, but one that's vertical and posteriorly shifted on the context of the face. It has a fairly prominent supraorbital torus, but a very projecting glabella. But in terms of the overall cranial profile of this specimen, it's the shape of the skull, it's very similar to the other Dimenisi specimens we've seen. So it is clearly the same kind of organism, the same species as the other Dimenisi specimen. And yet it gives us a picture that there's a lot of variation at Dimenisi, even though the specimens are coming from the same time, same place. So how do we begin to understand that? One way of understanding that is that at Dimenisi, unlike these early African sites that we have, we're sampling more variation associated with a normal population. That we have, for example, males and females from the same site, from the same time and place. Now these D2280 on the left, D4500 on the right, represent in my view the two males from the site. Probably a younger adult male on the left and an older adult male on the right. Now contrast this with what I interpret as the three females from the site. The young Dimenisi 2700 individual, the slightly older, maybe a couple years older D2282 individual, and the very old D3444 female. Now I see these as showing patterns of variation associated with sexual dimorphism, males and females. And one of the things you see is that the range of variation in terms of size is dramatically overlapping. The smallest specimen in terms of endocranial volume is D4500. The largest one is D2280. If these are both males, they suggest there's a huge amount of variation within sex, but also significant differences between sex when we make these comparisons. Looking at them interiorly, we can also see that there's variation associated with age at this site. The D2700 individual is the youngest individual at the site. D2282 is just slightly older, but the two adults, D3444 and D4500, represent dramatically older individuals. So we have variation with age, variation with sex. These are the two primary determinants of anatomical variation in standing populations, and we have them all from the same time and place. This is what makes Dimenisi so valuable, is we can sample what normal variation looks like. So to illustrate the importance of this, we can look, for example, at the D2700 individual. We can see that it is very similar to, for example, ER1813, that we think of as Homo habilis. And yet, the other specimens from the site, for example, the D2280 individual, looks very much like ER3733, an early Homo erectus site from East Africa. So we can see this range of variation from more habilis-like to more erectus-like, all from the same site. And the reason that variation exists is because we're sampling males and females, old and young, from the same site. This is unique to Dimenisi and represents the value Dimenisi has, not just for understanding what's going on at Dimenisi, not just for what's going on with these earliest fossil hominins dispersing out of Africa, to go and reinterpret it from the perspective of a site that provides this wonderful window as to what normal variation looks like.